Well, it's good to be here. I bring you greetings from the Republic of Texas. And uh, I am very pleased to be here in, in Montana. This is my 49th state to visit. Got one more to go. It's that North Dakota place. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. It's like two weeks a year when it would be okay for me to go there. Um, but no, seriously, as I, as I flew in and looked down um, uh, upon the terrain, I'm, I'm looking at these rivers and lakes and streams and mountains and everything else. And I, I, when we landed, I, I looked back and I, I told uh, Philip, my, my assistant, and soon to be son-in-law, um, I, I said, I'm, I'm moving to Montana. <laughs> really, this is some of the most beautiful country I've ever seen um, in my entire life. Um, of course, when it gets cold, I'm leaving. Um, so, Over the course of this weekend, I'm going to be addressing uh, the topic of family-driven faith. Um, I'm going to be addressing the topic of family discipleship and the role that that plays in this whole idea of, of reformation. Um, it, what's very interesting is that one of the, one of the long-standing traditions within the reformed tradition is the idea of purposeful, intentional, systematic discipleship of children in their homes. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's ab absolutely unheard of for people in reform circles and in reform traditions to not be about the business of discipling their children. In fact, um, in the Church of Scotland, which we now know as the Presbyterian Church, uh, in the Church of Scotland, a man who, who was not actively engaging regularly engaging in family discipleship, in catechizing his children, and in regular family worship, uh, was disciplined by the church. He was disciplined by the church. Just, just like he was committing adultery, okay? It was completely and utterly unheard of for this not to be the case. Um, catechism was a regular part of family life. Um, now you have people who call themselves reformed who don't even know what a catechism is, okay? And so if we don't know what catechism is, we're certainly not catechizing our children. We can't say amen, you ought to say ouch, okay? Um, so this is something that's very important. I want, you to, I, I want you to understand that this is something that fits right smack dab within the context of talking about reformation and talking about our reformed heritage. This is part of our reformed heritage. Um, but to start, what I want to share is kind of the, the anti-family message, if you will. It's found in Genesis chapter 41. Now, interestingly enough, Genesis chapter 41 is one of the most popular uh, chapters in the entire Bible. We love Genesis 41. Genesis 41 is couched right there in the Joseph narrative in the book of Genesis. And in this part of the Joseph narrative, this is where Joseph um, is elevated to second in command to Pharaoh. We, we all know this story. And we usually think about this story as kind of the payoff moment for Joseph, right? Uh, things have been bad for him, um, but now all of a sudden everything's going to turn around and it's going to be good for him. Um, and we think this is great. His brothers hated him. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, here he is, powerful man. Um, and my, my, my thesis today is this. Genesis 41 is not only not the payoff in Joseph's life, but Genesis 41 is actually the low point. It's actually the low point. We think of it as the high point, but it's actually the low point. Why are we so wrong in the way that we interpret this passage of scripture? I think a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is because of our affinity for movies uh, and for good books. But when you read movies and you read good literature, uh, there's, there's this thing called a character arc. And the character arc, especially for a protagonist, you know, uh, the character arc goes something like this. The character is introduced, all right? And things are sort of plodding along. Um, and, 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 you know, you're learning some good stuff about this character. So his life is going well. All of a sudden, something bad happens. And so the arc goes down. And all of a sudden, he has to fight and climb his way back up, you know? 
and then things are going good for him. And just before things get all right for him, it goes way down. And all of a sudden, there's some conflict that brings them back up, and they all live happily ever after, okay? That's the character arc of a good story, okay? It has some conflict in it, some ups and downs in it, but it ends on a high note. If it doesn't end on a high note, then it's called a tragedy, right? Literally, that's, 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 that's a tragedy. Um, but So we're used to that, and we know what a story looks like when the good guy finally wins in the end. And if you know that, then, you know, here's Joseph and he's plodding along and he's a good kid and his father loves him and all of a sudden they put him in a hole and he gets sold into slavery. Well, that's okay because, you know, he's in Potiphar's house and things are going well for him and Potiphar's house is prospering because everything Joseph touches is prospering. And so the ark comes back up and then all of a sudden Potiphar's wife lies on him, bam, he goes into prison. Now things are worse, right? And then all of a sudden he interprets these two dreams you know, the baker and the cupbearer, these dreams come to pass. He's forgotten for two more years, so he's not quite up top yet. And then all of a sudden, whew, second in command of Pharaoh. So if you're a movie goer, or if you read good literature, that sounds like the perfect, you know, character arc for a hero. Small problem. Genesis has 50 chapters. This happens in chapter 41. Joseph's story is not over yet. It's only beginning, okay? We're introduced to Joseph in 37. 38 is not even about Joseph, it's about Judah. We get 39, 40, now here we're at 41. We got nine more chapters. So there are more chapters to come than there have been chapters covered. So how could 41 be the apex of his character arc? It can't, okay? Second reason that we misinterpret chapter 41 is because we don't understand how to read the Old Testament in general and how to read Old Testament narrative in particular. We, we just don't get it. We see this, you know, sort of radical um, division and radical discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And because of that, and many Christians believe that there's little or nothing in the Old Testament um, for us little or nothing in the Old Testament um, that really involves us. Um, and, and unless it, you know, something that is explicitly, um, you know, re referring to, to Christ and his work, then it's kind of like that was for Israel and, you know, what do we have to do with that? Then in a more particular way, it's because we're not reading Genesis correctly. So what I want to do first is I want to give you um, just a, 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 a brief introduction to this book and then we'll look at chapter 41 in light of the context as a whole. When you look at the context of Genesis, there's two ways to divide it up. One way you can divide it up is through the Toledotes. The Toledot is a Hebrew word for generations, okay? These are the generations of. That happens 11 times in Genesis. 11 times, these are the generations of. It's really important. We start off with the generations of the heavens and the earth, and then we got the generations of Adam, then we got the generations of Noah, right? And then we got the generations of Noah's sons, and then we have the generations of Shem, and then we have the generations of Terah, and then we have the generations of Ishmael, and then the generations of Isaac, and then the generation of Esau two times, and then the generations of Jacob. So those are the natural divisions of the book of Genesis, okay? If you're trying to divide it up, you're trying to outline it, the most natural division is the 11 Toledotes. Well, if you divide it up that way, the story of Joseph is within the Toledote of Jacob. So here's the newsflash. Joseph's not the hero of the story because the story's not even about him. The story's about Jacob and how Jacob becomes Israel, right? So how can chapter 41 be the apex of the Joseph story when the Joseph story is really the Jacob story in the first place? That's kind of messed up, isn't it? So this story is about Jacob. So Joseph fits within the Toledot of Jacob. There's a second way that you can look at the book of Genesis. And that's dividing it up into the three main themes that occur again and again and again in every aspect of the book. You look at the book and it's divided into creation, Fall and then redemption, okay? Creation and then fall and then redemption. 
And in each of those three areas, you see these three things, land, seed, and covenant. Land, seed, and covenant. Land, seed, and covenant. You got to grasp that if you want to grasp Genesis. So in creation, what do we see? Well, immediately we see the land. God creates the heavens and the earth and he separates the sea from the dry ground or the land. And then we see seed. Everything reproduces according to its own kind, according to its own seed. Okay. And then we see covenant. We see the Abrahamic covenant, God's covenant with Abraham. So we see land, seed, and covenant there in creation. How about in the fall? Well, in the fall, and I look at the fall two times here in Genesis, one in the garden. In the garden, there is the land, and because of the fall, Adam gets kicked out of the land. In the fall, there is the seed. What seed? Well, chapter 3, verse 16, or verse 15. Uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Okay? Thirdly, covenant. Same verse. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, your seed, her seed. You will bruise his heel, he will bruise your head. There's the covenant. There's the, there's the proto, proto-euangelion, proto the first proclamation of the gospel. That the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the snake. That there is going to be a last Adam who, who, who overcomes what the first Adam did. He's going to succeed where the first Adam fails. Isn't it interesting that the first Adam fails because of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. And the last Adam, early on in the book of Matthew, is tempted three ways by Satan. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. First Adam fails, last Adam doesn't. So in the fall in the garden, land, seed, covenant. What about in the fall of the flood? What's that about? Where there's sin all over the land. And so God is going to purge man from the land because of his sin. And so God floods the whole land. So there's land. What about seed? Well, God builds an ark in order to protect the promised seed. Because the story of redemption is ultimately about the seed of the woman being protected until the promised seed comes and defeats the serpent. So Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives all make it onto the ark so that the seed is protected. After the flood, what do you have? The rainbow, covenant, land, seed, covenant. And then as we continue on in redemption, we have Abraham. What happens with Abraham? Well, there's a covenant that involves a promised seed and involves a promised land. What happens with Isaac? A renewal of the covenant that involves a promised seed and a promised land. What happens with Jacob? A renewal of the covenant that involves a promised seed and a promised land. Land, seed, covenant, over, 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 and over, and over again. So this is the way that we need to be thinking as we read Genesis. We need to ask ourselves, which, which Toledot are we in the middle of, right? And then how are we seeing the fulfillment of these promises of land and seed and covenant? Okay, when we ask ourselves that, Genesis 41 looks differently. Look with me if you will. Genesis 41, let's begin at verse 37. The dream has already been interpreted. Pharaoh's had these, these, these two dreams. Um, and, and by the way, it's interesting, the symmetry there. Joseph has two dreams in 37, and, and his brothers hate him and put him in a hole. Then he has two dreams in 40, the baker and the cupbearer. One loves him, the other one not so much. And now Pharaoh has two dreams, and he interprets these two dreams. Seven years is going to be plenty. Store up during the seven years, because after that, there are going to be seven years of famine. And you need to have enough to make it through those seven years. And we find in verse 37, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Isn't it amazing that when he has dreams within the covenant community, they don't respond by saying, this is God communicating to us. By the way, why are they wealthy in the first place? Why is Jacob, as we would say, filthy, stank, nasty, rich? Here's why. Laban tries to trick him several times. You remember that? With the flocks? 
And God communicates to him through dreams so that he is not taken advantage of and acquires great wealth. When God communicates to Jacob and changes his name to Israel, Jacob has a dream about the latter. So this family knows about God revealing himself in dreams to the people of the covenant community. So when Joseph comes and has these dreams, the people in the covenant community ought to have their ears attuned, but they don't. See, this is irony. They didn't listen. And Pharaoh, a man who believes that he is the incarnation of Ra, says, where can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? That's irony, folks. The wrong person is believing here. His brothers and his father should have believed, but they didn't. Pharaoh shouldn't believe, but he does. We continue. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see I have set you over all the land of Egypt. There's two problems there. Number one, house. In chapter 40 and 41, I believe the word house is used 10 times. House. All the way, going all the way back to 39. Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house. And his house prospers because of Joseph. The prison prospers because of Joseph. And all of the prison guards house and now Pharaoh puts Joseph over his house ask yourself this question whose house is supposed to be prospering right now because of Joseph the answer to that question is easy it's Jacob Jacob's house is supposed to be prospering because of Joseph what, what was Joseph doing in the first place when he ran upon his brothers he was going and checking on all of the prosperity of Jacob's house and coming back to give a report to his father and in the midst of that he sold into slavery so now he should be over Jacob's house but instead he's over Pharaoh's house it's the wrong house and then as though you know we needed a little bit more convincing Moses says he's over all the land of Egypt God made a promise of land Egypt is not the land of promise in fact Egypt, throughout the rest of redemptive history, will be understood as the antithesis of the land of promise. So now, Joseph is believed by the wrong man, he's over the wrong house, and he's in the wrong land. And we see this as a positive thing. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. He's not supposed to be in Egypt. It's the wrong land. Look again. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Need a little more irony? Joseph had another robe on in chapter 37. It wasn't the robe of fine linen from Pharaoh. It was a robe of many colors from Jacob. Whose robe was he supposed to be wearing? Jacob's. Whose robe was he wearing instead? Pharaoh's. We were never meant to see this as a good thing. Never, ever, ever were we meant to see this as a good thing. You read this in context. This is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. We continue on. And he made him ride in the second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee, lest he set him over the land of Egypt. Isn't this interesting? He say, basically, his two dreams say to his brother, you guys are going to bow the knee to me. God says, you're going to bow the knee to me. And his brothers say, we'll kill you before we do that. 
I don't care what God says. We'll kill you before we bow the knee to you. This Hebrew goes out before the Egyptians and Pharaoh says, bow the knee and the Egyptians are glad to do it. He's a slave. They'll gladly bow the knee before a slave. His brothers refuse to do it and would rather see him dead. This is irony. Well, I know that for some of you, this story is so meaningful and so loved that you don't want to let it go. You want to believe that it's to be interpreted the way we've always interpreted and that you're supposed to see this as a good thing. And so you're clinging now as though for dear life, holding on by your fingernails to the idea that this really is Joseph's payoff. But I am about to step on your fingers. <laughs> Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonath Paneah. Now, I seem to remember elsewhere in the Bible where people's names are changed. People who have covenant names to identify with them with the covenant community, who then have pagans change their names. And we generally don't think about that as being a good thing. So why on God's green earth would it be a good thing in Genesis? If it's a bad thing in Daniel, for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, why would it be a good thing for Joseph to have a covenant name changed to a pagan name by a pagan king who's doing it in honor of his pagan God? Why would that ever be a good thing? And why did we ever think of this as a good thing? That should have screamed at us. This is wrong. Don't smile. Cry. And yet, how many times we tell a little Sunday school story? Boys and girls, if you just be good and people hate you and they're mean to you, just hold on and God will do for you what he did to Joseph. He'll snatch you away from the bosom of your family take you to a pagan land, give you a pagan name and a pagan identity. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't you want it, children? There's another step. And he gave him in marriage, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Now he has a pagan wife. Just a few chapters earlier, in one of the most memorable events in all of the Bible, it's one of those events that just gets like seared, just gets seared in your mind because there's an old man, a really, really old man who says to another man, put your hand under my thigh. That image of the old man saying, Put your hand under my thigh. And us going, why? Why, why is that a thing? Why? Why, why do you, why? Oh, are you, are you going to swear? And so he's got, you know, here you see this picture of the servant, hand under thigh, swear to me that you will not take a wife for my son from among these people. Okay, I swear. We don't understand the whole hand under the thigh thing. But here's what we do understand. Abraham's getting too old to see to it himself. And he says to his servant, whatever you do, don't let my boy take a pagan wife. And now just a few chapters later, somebody has convinced us that when Joseph is forced to take a pagan wife, this is a story that we ought to present to children as a great thing. How wrong can we be? This is awful. This is awful. But then it gets good. A couple of things. 
Let me give you these. So the sake of time, let me just give you these things. Number one, what happens is, by the way, there's that picture right there is a picture of the land. Joseph's outside of the land. He's in the wrong land. This is not a good thing. He shouldn't be in this land. He's in the wrong land. But there are two more things. We have land and there should be two more things that we see. We should see what? Seed and covenant. Okay, great. So in the next paragraph, we see Joseph and he's collecting grain or seed. And something interesting happens. It says, verse... What is that? I can't see that number. Why do I use this Bible? Is that 50? And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. That sounds familiar. In fact, that exact phrase is the phrase that God used when he tells Jacob about his descendants, that they will be like the sand of the sea. You won't be able to number them. Do you think Moses put that there by accident? Somehow he's making a connection between this seed that's being stored up and the promised seed. Why? Well, you have to know the rest of the story. If you know the rest of the story, then you understand this. You understand that there's a famine and Joseph brother, Joseph's brothers are going to come to Egypt in order to buy grain. And Joseph is going to sell the grain to his brothers. But there's something else that's very interesting. Joseph is not the promised seed. He's not the next link in the chain that will bring forth the Messiah. There is another who is the promised seed. The other who is the promised seed is actually introduced first in 37. While all of this is going down, he's the one that says, don't kill him. If we kill him, we don't get anything for him. He's introduced again in chapter 38 because Joseph goes away involuntarily. Judah goes away voluntarily. Joseph takes a pagan wife by force. Ju Judah takes a pagan wife by choice. Joseph has children with his pagan wife. Judah has children not with his pagan wife, but with his pagan daughter-in-law through a very sinful set of circumstances. They're both away from the promised land. But one's outside of the will of God, the other one is directly in the middle of it. Here's the other thing. Eventually, Judah becomes the head of the family. How does he become the head of the family? Joseph wants him to bring all of his brothers. Benjamin wasn't with them. You gotta go back and bring Benjamin. Jacob does not trust these boys. He's suspicious about what happened to Joseph. So he will not send Benjamin until Judah, the promised seed, through whom we will eventually get Jesus, offers himself as a substitute for the son whom his father loves. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Judah has a great son named David who will eventually do that on behalf of the entire nation of Israel when he fights a giant in a valley as a substitute, as a champion to defeat the foe of God's people. And Judah and David have an even greater son, Jesus, who will go to another valley and defeat another foe and offer himself as a substitute for the sons whom his father loves. We see a foreshadowing. But if Joseph doesn't go to Egypt and store up grain, Judah starves to death and Jesus is never born. Joseph doesn't go to Egypt so that he can become rich and give us a picture of what it looks like to suddenly become wealthy. Joseph goes to Egypt so that Judah doesn't die, so that David could be born, so that Jesus could be born, so that God could save his people.
That's why he's in Egypt. Well, so we have land, we have seed. There's one more. There's covenant. He has two sons. Three things about the naming of his sons. One, he gives his sons Hebrew names, which means he is identifying with the covenant people of God. It's amazing. He gives them Hebrew names so that everyone who meets him and meets his sons is reminded that he's a Hebrew. Pharaoh can change my name. <laughs> he can even make me marry this woman. But I get to name my kids. And I give my kids Hebrew names because I identify with the people of God, with the covenant people of God. Regardless of his circumstances, he identifies with the covenant. Secondly, the, the names of his children. Manasseh. Manasseh means, you know, I have, I have forgotten all the hardship in my father's household. You know, you want to know my interpretation of the name Manasseh? Manasseh means I let that stuff go. Amen. I let that stuff go. Hey, Zaphonath Panea, it's interesting your boys have Hebrew names. I thought those people didn't like you, and I let that stuff go. Hey, man, Hebrew, Manasseh, sounds like you're identifying with those brothers who wanted to kill you. I'll let that stuff go. What about all that horrible stuff that happened in your life? I let that stuff go. He refused to be identified and defined by the difficulty and hardship of his past, but instead chose to be identified by the hope that was his in the God of the covenant. Did you hear me? Because some of us need that. Some of us need a Manasseh. Amen? Some of us need to let some stuff go. Because there are some of us who've been Christians for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and we still define ourselves by the difficulty and hardship of our past as opposed to the promises that are ours because of the God of the covenant. Why are you so mean? Well, you know, it's this red hair. Well, you know, it's my hot Irish blood or Latin blood or black. Or black. It, it, notice how every, every different ethnicity has an excuse for sinful outrage. But wait, I, I thought you were in Christ. So the blood of Jesus is sufficient to save you from your sin, but not from your ethnic heritage. Help you if you believe that. Well, you know, I'm just not very trusting because I've been hurt in the past. Really? Manasseh, you need to let that stuff go. Well, you know, it's just really tough for me to be a father and to lead my family because I never had a father who lived. Manasseh, let that stuff go. Well, you know, the whole idea of being submissive to my husband, that's really hard because, you know, in my past I had Manasseh, let it go. Stop being defined. By the sin and the heartache and the difficulty and the pain of your past. And instead, be defined by the God of the covenant who gives you a hope and a future. The next boy's name is Ephraim or Ephraim. Fruitful. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. This one, this one is off the charts. The first one you go, okay, I, I get that. You know, you let that stuff go. That's, I get that. Good on you, man. The second one, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Time out, Joseph. Because he made you, he made you fruitful in Egypt, right? Yes. Egypt, where you're second in command to the most powerful man on the universe. Yes. That's the land of your affliction. Yes. Not the land where people hated you and put you in a hole. As an alternative to killing you. Yes, this is the land of my affliction. Well, wait, 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 Egypt, where you have everything that you could want and then more. You ride in Pharaoh's Bentley. What else would you call the first chariot of the most powerful man in the world? Yeah, that's, that would be the equivalent in our day, okay? You ride in Pharaoh's Bentley. You wear the most expensive clothes in the world. 
You got gold around your neck and on your hand that comes from the king of all the kings in the world. And you call this the land of your affliction? Yes, sir, I do. Why? Because Joseph was waiting for a land that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Just like you and me, saints. No matter how good things get here in these United States, no matter how good it gets here in Montana, this is the land of our affliction. And not because of the guy who's in the White House right now, although that is rather afflicting, <laughs> but this is the land of our affliction. On our best days, this is the land of our affliction. Because there is going to come a day when every tear will be wiped from every eye. There will come a day when our bodies will stop decaying and they will be made new. There will come a day when we are known, when we know as we are known. There will come a day when suffering will end, when sorrow will end, when death will be no more. And we will see God face to face. Compared to that, everything else is the land of affliction. Joseph got that. And the only reason he got that is because of the covenant. See, this is where this hope. Sadly, we were holding on to hope because of the first part of this where he comes into Pharaoh's house in the wrong land and he's not with the people of the covenant anymore and so on and so forth. We used to sell that as the moment of hope. It's not. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason that there's hope is because God is going to use this grain to save the promised seed. The reason that there's hope is because the covenant people will go on. The reason that there's hope is because God will save his people. He is sovereign in spite of our circumstances. That's what we learn from Joseph. That God is sovereign in spite of our circumstances. So, how does this relate to this idea of family and so on and so forth? Well, here's a family that was all out of whack. And yet God used them for his purposes. Amen? You know what this says to me? I don't care how messed up your family is. God is able. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I don't care how messed up your family is. God is able. He uses Joseph. He saves Jacob's household. Preserves the covenant people. And brings about his desired end. Which is Judah. And the lion of the tribe of Judah and the salvation of God's elect by his grace and for his glory. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for the incredible privilege that is ours this privilege of knowing you and of being known by you. For this privilege of being able to trust you because you are a good God, because you are all wise, and because you are working all things according to the counsel of your own perfect will. Grant by your grace that we might Consider this as we endure dark days, frowning providences. Thank you for the many blessings that are ours because of your saving work that took place long before we were ever born. And thank you for the culmination of that work and the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen.